Lesson six, work to learn. Don't work for money. In 1995, I granted an interview with a newspaper in Singapore. The young female reporter was on time, and the interview got underway immediately. We sat in the lobby of a luxurious hotel, sipping coffee and discussing the purpose of my visit to Singapore. I was to share the platform with Zig Ziglar. He was speaking on motivation, and I was speaking on the secrets of the rich. Some day I'd like to be a best-selling author like you," she said. I'd seen some of the articles she'd written for the paper, and I was impressed. She had a tough, clear style of writing. Her articles held a reader's interest. "You have a great style," I said in reply. "What holds you back from achieving your dream?" "My work doesn't seem to go anywhere," she said quietly. "Everyone says that my novels are excellent, but nothing happens. So I keep my job with the paper. At least it pays the bills." Do you have any suggestions? Yes, I do. I said brightly. A friend of mine here in Singapore runs a school that trains people to sell. He runs sales training courses for many of the top corporations here in Singapore. And I think attending one of his courses would greatly enhance your career. She stiffened. Are you saying that I should go to school to learn to sell? I nodded. I have a master's degree in English literature. Why would I go to school to learn to be a salesperson? I'm a professional. She was now packing her briefcase forcibly. The interview was over. On the coffee table sat a copy of my first book. I picked it up as well as the notes that she jotted down in her legal pad. Do you see this? I said, pointing to her notes. She looked down at her notes. What? She said, confused. Again, I pointed deliberately to her notes. On her pad, she'd written, "Robert Kiyosaki, best-selling author." It says, "Best-selling author," not "best-writing author." Her eyes widened immediately. "I'm a terrible writer. You're a great writer. I went to sales school. You have a master's degree. Put them together, and you get a best-selling author, and a best." Writing author. Anger flared from her eyes. I'll never stoop so low as to learn how to sell. People like you have no business writing. I'm a professionally trained writer, and you're a salesman. It's not fair. The rest of her notes were put away, and she hurried out through the large glass doors into the humid Singapore morning. At least she gave me a fair and favorable write-up the next morning. The world is filled with smart, talented, educated, and gifted people. We meet them every day. They're all around us. I'm constantly shocked at how little talented people earn. I heard the other day that less than five percent of Americans earn more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. I've met brilliant, highly educated people who earn less than twenty thousand dollars a year. A business consultant. Who specializes in the medical trade was telling me how many doctors, dentists, and chiropractors struggle financially. All this time, I thought that when they graduated, the dollars would pour in. It was this business consultant who gave me the phrase, "They are one skill away from great wealth." What this phrase means is that most people need only to learn and master one more skill, and their income would jump exponentially. I have mentioned before that financial intelligence is a synergy of accounting, investing, marketing, and law. Combine these four technical skills, and making money with money is easier. When it comes to money, the only skill most people know is to work hard. The classic example of a synergy of skills was that young writer for the newspaper. If she diligently learned the skills of sales and marketing, her income would jump dramatically. If I were her, I would take some courses in advertising, copywriting, as well as sales. Then, instead of working at the newspaper, I would seek a job at an advertising agency. Even if it were a cut in pay, she'd learn how to communicate in shortcuts that are used in successful advertising. She also would spend time learning public relations. An important skill. She would learn how to get millions in free publicity. Then at night and on weekends, 
she could be writing her great novel. When it was finished, she'd be better able to sell her book. Then in a short while, she could be a best-selling author. When I graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy in 1969, my educated dad was happy. Standard Oil of California had hired me for its oil tanker fleet. I was the third mate, and the pay was low compared with my classmates, but it was okay for a first real job after college. My starting pay was about $42,000 a year, including overtime, and I only had to work for seven months. I had five months of vacation. If I'd wanted to, I could have taken the run to Vietnam with a subsidiary shipping company and easily doubled my pay instead of taking the five months' vacation. I had a great career ahead of me, yet I resigned after six months with the company and joined the Marine Corps to learn how to fly. My educated dad was devastated. Rich dad congratulated me. In school and in the workplace, the popular opinion is the idea of specialization. That is, in order to make more money or get promoted, you need to specialize. That is why medical doctors immediately begin to seek a specialty, such as orthopedics or pediatrics. The same is true for accountants, architects, lawyers, pilots, and others. My educated dad believed in the same dogma. That's why he was thrilled when he eventually achieved his doctorate. He often admitted that schools reward people who study more and more about less and less. Rich Dad encouraged me to do exactly the opposite. You want to know a little about a lot, was his suggestion. That's why for years I worked in different areas of his companies. For a while I worked in his accounting department. Although I would probably never have been an accountant, he wanted me to learn via osmosis. Rich Dad knew I would pick up jargon and a sense of what's important and what's not. I also worked as a busboy and construction worker, as well as in sales, reservations, and marketing. He was grooming Mike and me. That's why he insisted we sit in on the meetings with his bankers, lawyers, accountants, and brokers. He wanted us to know a little about every aspect of his empire. Educated Dad thought I went to school to learn to be a ship's officer. Rich Dad knew that I went to school to study international trade. So as a student, I made cargo runs navigating large freighters, oil tankers, and passenger ships to the Far East and the South Pacific. Rich Dad emphasized that I stay in the Pacific instead of taking ships to Europe, because he knew that the emerging nations were in Asia, not Europe. While most of my classmates, including Mike, were partying at their fraternity houses, I was studying trade, people, business styles and cultures in Japan, Taiwan, Thailand, Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Korea, Tahiti, Samoa, and the Philippines. I also was partying, but it was not in any frat house. I grew up rapidly. Educated Dad could not understand why I decided to quit and join the Marine Corps. I told him I wanted to learn to fly but really I wanted to learn to lead troops. Rich Dad explained to me that the hardest part of running a company is managing people. He'd spent three years in the Army. My educated dad was draft-exempt. Rich Dad told me of the value of learning to lead men into dangerous situations. Leadership is what you need to learn next, he said. If you're not a good leader, you'll get shot in the back, just like they do in business. Returning from Vietnam in 1973, I resigned my commission, even though I loved flying. I found a job with Xerox Corporation. I joined it for one reason, and it was not for the benefits. I was a shy person, and the thought of selling was the most frightening subject in the world. Xerox is one of the best sales training programs in America. Rich Dad was proud of me. My educated dad was ashamed. Being an intellectual, he thought that salespeople were below him. I worked with Xerox for four years, until I overcame my fear of knocking on doors and being rejected. Once I could consistently be in the top five in sales, I again resigned and moved on, leaving behind another great career with an excellent company. 
In 1977, I formed my first company. Rich Dad had groomed Mike and me to take over companies, so I now had to learn to form them and put them together. My first product, the nylon and Velcro wallet, was manufactured in the Far East and shipped to a warehouse in New York, near where I had gone to school. My formal education was complete, and it was time to test my wings. If I failed, I went broke. Rich Dad thought it best to go broke before 30. You still have time to recover, was his advice. On the eve of my 30th birthday, my first shipment left Korea for New York. Today I still do business internationally, and as my rich dad encouraged me to do, I keep seeking the emerging nations. Today my investment company invests in South America, Asia, Norway, and Russia. There's an old cliché that goes, job is an acronym for just over broke. And unfortunately, I would say that the saying applies to millions of people. Because school does not think financial intelligence is an intelligence, most workers live within their means. They work and they pay bills. There's another horrible management theory that goes, workers work hard enough to not be fired, and owners pay just enough so that workers won't quit. And if you look at the pay scales of most companies, again I would say there is a degree of truth in that statement. The net result is that most workers never get ahead. They do what they've been taught to do. Get a secure job. Most workers focus on working for pay and benefits that reward them in the short term, but is often disastrous in the long run. Instead, I recommend to young people to seek work for what they will learn more than what they will earn. Look down the road at what skills they want to acquire before choosing a specific profession and before getting trapped in the rat race. When I speak to adults who want to earn more money, I always recommend the same thing. I suggest taking a long view of their life. Instead of simply working for the money and security, which I admit are important, I suggest they take a second job that will teach them a second skill. Often I recommend joining a network marketing company, also called multi-level marketing, if they want to learn sales skills. Some of these companies have excellent training programs that help people get over their fear of failure and rejection, which are the main reasons people are unsuccessful. Education is more valuable than money in the long run. When I ask the classes I teach, how many of you can cook a better hamburger than McDonald's? Almost all of the students raise their hands. I then ask, so if most of you can cook a better hamburger, how come McDonald's makes more money than you? The answer is obvious. McDonald's is excellent at business systems. The reason so many talented people are poor is because they focus on building a better hamburger and know little to nothing about business systems. A friend of mine in Hawaii is a great artist. He makes a sizable amount of money. One day his mother's attorney called to tell him that she had left him $35,000. That is what was left of her estate after the attorney and the government took their shares. Immediately he saw an opportunity to increase his business by using some of this money to advertise. Two months later, his first four-color full-page ad appeared in an expensive magazine that targeted the very rich. The ad ran for three months. He received no replies from the ad. And all of his inheritance is now gone. He now wants to sue the magazine for misrepresentation. This is a common case of someone who can build a beautiful hamburger but knows little about business. When I asked him what he'd learned, his only reply was that advertising salespeople are crooks. I then asked him if he'd be willing to take a course in sales and a course in direct marketing. His reply, I don't have the time and I don't want to waste my money. The world is filled with talented poor people. All too often they're poor or struggle financially or earn less than they're capable of, not because of what they know, but because of what they do not know. They focus on perfecting their skills at building a better hamburger rather than the skills of selling and delivering the hamburger. Maybe McDonald's does not make the best hamburger, 
but they are the best at selling and delivering a basic average burger. Poor Dad wanted me to specialize. That was his view on how to be paid more. Rich Dad advised that Mike and I groom ourselves. Many corporations do the same thing. They find a young, bright student out of business school and begin grooming that person to someday take over the company. So these bright young employees do not specialize in one department. They're moved from department to department to learn all the aspects of business systems. The rich often groom their children or the children of others. By doing so, their children gain an overall knowledge of the operations of the business and how the various departments interrelate. For the World War II generation, it was considered bad to skip from company to company. Today, it's considered smart. Since people will skip from company to company rather than seek greater specialization, why not seek to learn more than earn? In the short term, it may earn you less. In the long term, it will pay off in large dividends. The main management skills needed for success are the management of cash flow, the management of systems, including yourself and time with family, and the management of people. The most important specialized skills are sales and understanding marketing. It's the ability to sell, therefore to communicate to another human being, be it a customer, employee, boss, spouse, or child, that is the base skill of personal success. It is communication skills such as writing, speaking, and negotiating that are crucial to a life of success. It's a skill that I work on constantly, attending courses or buying educational tapes to expand my knowledge. Rich Dad encouraged Mike and me to know a little about a lot. He encouraged us to work with people smarter than we were and to bring smart people together to work as a team. Today it would be called a synergy of professional specialties. Today I meet ex-school teachers earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. They earn that much because they have specialized skills in their field, as well as other skills. They can teach as well as sell and market. I know of no other skills to be more important than selling as well as marketing. The skills of selling and marketing are difficult for most people, primarily due to their fear of rejection. The better you are at communicating, negotiating, and handling your fear of rejection, the easier life is. Just as I advise that newspaper writer who wanted to become a best-selling author, I advise anyone else today. Being technically specialized has its strengths as well as its weaknesses. I have friends who are geniuses, but they cannot communicate effectively with other human beings. And as a result, their earnings are pitiful. I advise them to just spend a year learning to sell. And even if they earn nothing, their communication skills will improve. And that is priceless. Getting started. I wish I could say acquiring wealth was easy for me, but it wasn't. So in response to the question, how do I start? I offer the thought process I go through on a day-by-day -day basis. It really is easy to find great deals. I promise you that. It's just like riding a bike. After a little wobbling, it's a piece of cake. But when it comes to money, it's the determination to get through the wobbling that's a personal thing. To find million-dollar deals of a lifetime requires us to call on our financial genius. I believe that each of us has a financial genius within us. The problem is, our financial genius lies asleep, waiting to be called upon. It lies asleep because our culture has educated us into believing that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's encouraged us to learn a profession so we can work for money, but failed to teach us how to have money work for us. It taught us not to worry about our financial future. Our company or the government would take care of us when our working days are over. However, it's our children, educated in the same school system, who will end up paying for it. The message is still to work hard, earn money, and spend it. And when we run short, we can always borrow more.
Unfortunately, 90% of the Western world subscribes to the above dogma simply because it's easier to find a job and work for money. If you're not one of the masses, I offer you the following 10 steps to awaken your financial genius. I simply offer you the steps I have personally followed. If you want to follow some of them, great. If you don't, make up your own. Your financial genius is smart enough to develop its own list. Step number one. I need a reason greater than reality. If you ask most people if they would like to be rich or financially free, they would say yes. But then reality sets in. The road seems too long with too many hills to climb. It's easier just to work for money and hand the excess over to your broker. A reason or a purpose is a combination of wants and don't wants. When people ask me what my reason for wanting to be rich is, it's a combination of deep emotional wants and don't wants. I will list a few. First, the don't wants, for they create the wants. I don't want to work all my life. I don't want what my parents aspired for, which was job security and a house in the suburbs. I don't like being an employee. Now the wants. I want to be free to travel the world and live in a lifestyle I love. I want to be young when I do this. I want to simply be free. I want control over my time and my life. I want money to work for me. Those are deep-seated emotional reasons. What are yours? As I said, I wish I could say it was easy. It wasn't. But it wasn't hard either. But without a strong reason or purpose, Anything in life is hard. Step number two. I choose daily. The power of choice. That is the main reason people want to live in a free country. We want the power to choose. Financially, with every dollar we get in our hands, we hold the power to choose our future to be rich, poor, or middle class. Our spending habits reflect who we are. Poor people simply have poor spending habits. Most people choose not to be rich. For 90% of the population, being rich is too much of a hassle. So they invent sayings that go, I'm not interested in money, or I'll never be rich, or I don't have to worry, I'm still young, or when I make some money, then I'll think about my future, or... My husband, wife, handles the finances. The problem with those statements is they rob the person who chooses to think such thoughts of two things. One is time, which is your most precious asset. And two is learning. Just because you have no money, it shouldn't be an excuse to not learn. But that is a choice we all make daily. The choice of what we do with our time, our money, and what we put in our heads. That is the power of choice. All of us have choice. I just choose to be rich, and I make that choice every day. Step number three. Choose friends carefully. First of all, I do not choose my friends by their financial statements. I have friends who have actually taken the vow of poverty, as well as friends who earn millions every year. The point is... I learn from all of them, and I consciously make the effort to learn from them. But there's one distinction that I'd like to point out. I've noticed that my friends with money talk about money, and I do not mean brag. They're interested in the subject, so I learn from them, and they learn from me. My friends whom I know are in dire straits financially do not like talking about money, business, or investing. They often think it rude. So I also learn from my friends who struggle financially. I find out what not to do. Step number four. Master a formula and then learn a new one. In order to make bread, every baker follows a recipe, even if it's only held in their head. The same is true for making money. That's why money is often called dough. When it comes to money, 
The masses generally have one basic formula they learned in school, and that is work for money. The formula I see that is predominant in the world is that every day millions of people get up and go to work, earn money, pay bills, balance checkbooks, buy some mutual funds, and go back to work. That is the basic formula or recipe. If you're tired of what you're doing or you're not making enough, it's simply a case of changing the formula via which you make money. Years ago, when I was 26, I took a weekend class called How to Buy Real Estate Foreclosures. I learned a formula. The next trick was to have the discipline to actually put into action what I had learned. That is where most people stop. For three years while working for Xerox, I spent my spare time learning to master the art of buying foreclosures. I've made several million dollars using that formula, but today it's too slow, and too many other people are doing it. So after I mastered that formula, I went in search of other formulas. For many of the classes, I did not use the information I learned directly, but I always learned something new. Step number five. Pay yourself first. The power of self-discipline. If you cannot get control of yourself, do not try to get rich. You might first want to join the Marine Corps or some religious order so you can get control of yourself. It makes no sense to invest, make money, and blow it. It's the lack of self-discipline that causes most lottery winners to go broke soon after winning millions. It's the lack of self-discipline that causes people who get a raise to immediately go out and buy a new car or take a cruise. It's difficult to say which of the ten steps is the most important, but of all the steps, this step is probably the most difficult to master if it's not already a part of your makeup. I would venture to say that it's the lack of personal self-discipline that is the number one delineating factor between the rich, poor, and middle class. I do not take the saying, pay yourself first, lightly. The Richest Man in Babylon by George Classen is where the statement, pay yourself first, comes from. Millions of copies have been sold. But while millions of people freely repeat that powerful statement, few follow the advice. For those who do follow it, their financial statement, income statement, and balance sheet shows income flowing into assets and assets supplying income. Each month, these people allocate money to their asset column before they pay their monthly expenses. Although millions of people have read Klassen's book and understand the words pay yourself first, in reality, they pay themselves last. Now, I can hear the howls from those of you who sincerely believe in paying your bills first. And I can hear all the responsible people who pay their bills on time. I'm not saying be irresponsible and not pay your bills. All I'm saying is do what the program says, which is pay yourself first. The reason I don't have high credit card debt and doodad debt is because I want to pay myself first. Although I pay my bills last, I am financially astute enough to not get into a tough financial situation. To ensure paying yourself first, don't get into large debt positions that you have to pay for. Keep your expenses low. Build up assets first. Then, buy the big house or a nice car. Being stuck in the rat race is not intelligent. And when you come up short, let the pressure build and don't dip into your savings or investments. Use the pressure to inspire your financial genius to come up with new ways of making more money and then pay your bills you will have increased your ability to make more money as well as your financial intelligence. Step number six, pay your brokers well. I often see people posting a sign in front of their house that says, for sale by owner. Or I see on TV today, many people claiming to be discount brokers. My rich dad taught me to take the opposite tack. He believed in paying professionals well, and I have adopted that policy also. Today I have expensive attorneys, accountants, real estate brokers, and stockbrokers. Why? Because if, and I do mean if, the people are professionals, 
Their services should make you money. And the more money they make, the more money I make. We live in an information age. Information is priceless. A good broker should provide you with information as well as take the time to educate you as to its meaning. Step number seven. Be an Indian giver. This is the power of getting something for nothing. When the first white settlers came to America, they were taken aback by a cultural practice some American Indians had. For example, if a settler was cold, the Indian would give the person a blanket. Mistaking it for a gift, the settler was often offended when the Indian asked for it back. The Indians also got upset when they realized the settlers did not want to give it back. That is where the term Indian giver came from. A simple cultural misunderstanding. In the world of the asset column, being an Indian giver is vital to wealth. The sophisticated investor's first question is, how fast do I get my money back? They also want to know what they get for free, also called a piece of the action. That is why the ROI, or return of and on investment, is so important. Frequently, my broker will call me and recommend I move a sizable amount of money into the stock of a company that he feels is just about to make a move that will add value to the stock, like announcing a new product. I will move my money in for a week to a month while the stock moves up. Then I pull my initial dollar amount out and stop worrying about the fluctuations of the market because my initial money is back and ready to work on another asset. So my money goes in, and then it comes out. And I own an asset that was technically free. Step number eight. Assets buy luxuries. As I said in the section, pay yourself first. If a person cannot master the power of self-discipline, it's best not to try to get rich. For while the process of developing cash flow from an asset column in theory is easy, it's the mental fortitude of directing money that's hard. Due to external temptations, it's much easier in today's consumer world to simply blow it out of the expense column. Because of weak mental fortitude, that money flows into the paths of least resistance. That is the cause of poverty and financial struggle. I love my luxuries as much as anyone else. The difference is, some people buy their luxuries on credit. It's the keep up with the Joneses trap. I use the income from my assets to buy my luxuries. When I wanted to buy a Porsche, the easy road would have been to call my banker and get a loan. Instead of choosing to focus in the liability column, I chose to focus in the asset column. As a habit, I used my desire to consume to inspire and motivate my financial genius to invest. Too often today, we focus on borrowing money to get the things we want, instead of focusing on creating money. One is easier in the short term, but harder in the long term. It's a bad habit that we as individuals and as a nation have gotten into. Remember, the easy road often becomes hard, and the hard road often becomes easy. The earlier you can train yourself and those you love to be masters of money, the better. Money is a powerful force. Unfortunately, people use the power of money against them. If your financial intelligence is low, money will run all over you. It will be smarter than you. If money is smarter than you, you will work for it all your life. Step number nine. The need for heroes. When I was a kid, I greatly admired Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Yogi Berra, they were my heroes. As a kid playing Little League, I wanted to be just like them. I treasured their baseball cards. I wanted to know everything about them. I knew the stats, the RBI, the ERAs, their batting averages, how much they got paid, and how they came up from the minors. I wanted to know everything because I wanted to be just like them. Every time, as a 9- or 10-year-old kid, when I stepped up to bat or played first base or catcher, it wasn't me. I was Yogi or Hank. 
It's one of the most powerful ways we learn that we often lose as adults. We lose our heroes. We lose our naivete. I have new heroes as I grow older. I have golf heroes such as Peter Jacobson, Fred Couples, and Tiger Woods. I copy their swings and do my best to read everything I can about them. I also have heroes such as Donald Trump, Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, George Soros, and Jim Rogers. In my older years, I know their stats, just like I knew the ERAs and RBI of my baseball heroes. I follow what Warren Buffett invests in, and read anything I can about his point of view on the market. I read Peter Lynch's book to understand how he chooses stocks, and I read about Donald Trump, trying to find out how he negotiates and puts deals together. Just as I was not me when I was up to bat, when I'm in the market or I'm negotiating a deal, I am subconsciously acting with the bravado of Trump. Or when analyzing a trend, I look at it as though Peter Lynch were doing it. By having heroes, we tap into a tremendous source of raw genius. But heroes do more than simply inspire us. Heroes make things look easy. It's the making it look easy that convinces us to want to be just like them. If they can do it, so can I. Step number ten: Teach. And you shall receive. Both of my dads were teachers. My rich dad taught me a lesson I've carried all my life, and that was the necessity of being charitable or giving. My educated dad gave a lot by the way of time and knowledge, but almost never gave money. As I said, he usually said that he would give when he had some extra money. Of course, there was rarely any extra. My rich dad gave money, as well as education. He believed firmly in tithing. If you want something, you first need to give. He would always say. When he was short of money, he simply gave money to his church or to his favorite charity. If I could leave one single idea with you, it's that idea. Whenever you feel short or in need of something, give what you want first, and it will come back in buckets. That's true for money, a smile, love. Friendship. I know it's often the last thing a person may want to do, but it's always worked for me. I just trust that the principle of reciprocity is true, and I give what I want. My rich dad would often say, "Poor people are more greedy than rich people." He would explain that if a person was rich, that person was providing something that other people wanted. In my life, over all these years, whenever I felt needy or short of money or short of help, I simply went out and found in my heart what I wanted, and decided to give it first. And when I gave, it always came back. It reminds me of the story of the guy sitting with firewood in his arms on a cold, freezing night, and he's yelling at the pot-bellied stove, "When you give me some heat, then I'll put some wood in." And when it comes to money. Love, happiness, sales, and contacts—all one needs to remember is first to give what you want, and it will come back in droves. My poor dad taught teachers, and he became a master teacher. My rich dad always taught young people his way of doing business. In retrospect, it was their generosity with what they knew that made them smarter. There are powers in this world that are much smarter than we are. You can get there on your own, but it's easier with the help of the powers that be. All you need to be is generous with what you have, and the powers will be generous with you. Take action. All of you were given two great gifts: your mind and your time. It is up to you to do what you please with both. With each dollar bill that enters your hand, you and only you have the power to determine your destiny. Spend it foolishly, you choose to be poor. Spend it on liabilities, you join the middle class. Invest it in your mind, and learn how to acquire assets, and you will be choosing wealth as your goal and your future. The choice is yours and only yours. With every day, with every dollar, you decide to be rich, poor, or middle class. Choose to share this knowledge with your children, and you choose to prepare them for the world that awaits. No one else will. 
you and your children's future will be determined by choices you make today, not tomorrow. This has been a Time Warner Audiobooks production of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, written by Robert Kiyosaki with Sharon L. Lecter, CPA, and read by Stephen Hoy, featuring an introduction by Robert Kiyosaki. Executive producer, Maya Thomas. Produced and directed by John Runette. Text abridged by John Whitman. Text edited by William Whittington. Production coordinated by Daniel Metcalf. Rich Dad, Poor Dad is also available in paperback from Warner Business Books. Here's a sample from audio bestseller Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant, a guide to financial freedom. Written by Robert T. Kiyosaki with Sharon L. Lecter, CPA. When people ask why Kim and I were homeless back in 1985, I tell them it was because of what my rich dad taught me about money. For me, money is important, yet I did not want to spend my life working for it. That is why I did not want a job. If we were going to be responsible citizens, Kim and I wanted to have our money work for us rather than spend our lives physically working for money. That is why the cash flow quadrant is so important. It distinguishes between the different ways in which money is generated. There are ways of being responsible and creating money other than physically working for it. But in order to embrace wealth, it is essential to understand your relation to it. My highly educated dad had a strong belief that the love of money was evil, that to profit excessively meant you were greedy. He often said, I'll never be rich, or investing is risky, or money isn't everything. My rich dad had a different point of view. He thought it foolish to spend your life working for money and pretend that money was not important. Rich dad believed that life was more important than money, but money was important for supporting life. He often said, you only have so many hours a day, and you can only work so hard. So why work hard for money? Learn to have money, and people work hard for you and you can be free to do the things that are important. To my rich dad, what was important was to have lots of time to raise his kids, to have money to donate to charities and projects he supported, to bring jobs and financial stability to the community, to have time and money to take care of his health, and to be able to travel the world with his family. Those things take money, said rich dad. That is why money is important to me. Money is important, but I don't want to spend my life working for it. It was my rich dad who often referred to the cash flow quadrant when I was a young boy. He would explain to me the difference between someone who was successful on the left side versus the right side. Having two dynamic and successful father figures around me gave meaning to what each was saying. But it was what they were doing that allowed me to begin to notice the differences between the ES side of the quadrant and the BI side. One painful lesson I experienced as a young boy was simply how much time one dad had available to spend with me versus the other. As the success and prominence of both dads grew, it was obvious that one dad had less and less time to spend with his wife and four children. My real dad was always on the road, at meetings, or dashing off to the airport for more meetings. The more successful he got, the fewer dinners we had together as a family. Weekends he spent at home in his crowded little office buried under paperwork. My rich dad, on the other hand, had more and more free time as his success grew. One of the reasons I learned so much about money, finance, business, and life was simply because my rich dad had more and more free time for his children and me. Rich Dad's Cash Flow Quadrant is also available in paperback from Warner Business Books. Here's a sample from audio bestseller Rich Dad's Guide to Investing. What the Rich Invest in That the Poor and Middle Class Do Not Written by Robert T. Kiyosaki with Sharon L. Lecter, CPA Investor Lesson Number 1 The Choice When it comes to money and investing, people have three fundamental reasons or choices for investing, Rich Dad said. They are to be secure, to be comfortable, or to be rich. Rich Dad went on to say, All three choices are important. The difference in one's life occurs when the choices are prioritized. 
He explained that most people make their money and investment choices in that exact order. In other words, their first choice when it comes to money decisions is security. Second is comfort, and third is to be rich. That is why most people make job security their highest priority. After they have a secure job or profession, then they focus on comfort. The last choice for most people is to be rich. Rich Dad said, Most people dream of becoming rich, but it is not their first choice. He went on to say, Only three out of a hundred people in America are rich because of this priority of choices. For most people, if becoming rich disturbs their comfort or makes them feel insecure, they will forsake becoming rich. That is why so many people want that one hot investment tip. People who make security and comfort their first and second choices look for ways to get rich quick that are easy, risk-free, and comfortable. A few people do get rich on one lucky investment, but all too often, they lose it all again. I often hear people say, I'd rather be happy than rich. That comment has always sounded very strange to me, since I have been both rich and poor, and in both financial positions I have been both happy and unhappy. I wonder why people think they have to choose between happiness and being rich. When I reflect upon this lesson, it occurs to me that what people are really saying is that I'd rather feel secure and comfortable than be rich. That is because if they felt insecure or uncomfortable, they were not happy. For me, I was willing to feel insecure and uncomfortable in order to be rich. I have been rich and poor as well as happy and unhappy. But I assure you that when I was poor and unhappy, I was much unhappier than when I was rich and unhappy. I have also never understood the statement, money does not make you happy. While there is some truth in it, I have always noticed that when I have money, I feel pretty good. The other day I found a $10 bill in my jeans pocket. Even though it was only $10, it felt great finding it. Receiving money has always felt better than receiving a bill for money I owe. At least that is my experience with money. I feel happy when it comes in and sad when it leaves me. That day, I put my priorities in this order. First, to be rich, then to be comfortable, and finally, to be secure. Rich Dad's Guide to Investing is also available in paperback from Warner Business Books. Here's a sample from Rich Dad's Rich Kid, Smart Kid giving your children a financial head start. The latest book from the New York Times best-selling authors Robert T. Kiyosaki and Sharon L. Lecter, CPA. When I was a little boy, my rich dad often said, money is an idea. He would go on to say, money can be anything you want it to be. If you say, I'll never be rich, then the chances are you'll never be rich. If you say, I can't afford it, then chances are you can't. My smart dad said much the same about education. Is it possible that every child is born with the potential to be rich and smart? This program is about fostering and preserving that possibility. Both my dads were great teachers. Both men were smart men. But they were not smart in the same subjects, and they did not teach the same things. Yet as different as they were, both dads believed the same things about all kids. Both dads believed all kids are born smart and all kids are born rich. They both believed a child learns to be poor and learns to believe that he or she is less smart than other kids. Both dads were great teachers because they believed in bringing out the genius that each child is born with. In other words, they did not believe in putting knowledge in. They believed in bringing the child's genius out. Both my dads were great teachers because they rarely tried to cram their ideas into my head. They often said very little, waiting instead for me to ask when I wanted to know something. Or they asked me questions, seeking to find out what I knew, rather than simply telling me what they knew. And not to forget the moms. My mom was a great teacher and role model also. She was my teacher for unconditional love, kindness, and the importance of caring for other people. I once heard that boys marry women just like their moms, and I would say that is true for me. My wife Kim is also an extremely kind and loving person. I did not know my best friend Mike's mom very well. Yet the times I was over at their home, Mike's mother was also very kind and attentive to what we were doing. Although a very private person, she was always interested in what Mike and I were learning at school and in the business. I could tell she was a great life partner for Mike's dad. Although I did not know her very well, I learned from her the importance of listening to others, letting others talk, and being respectful of the ideas of others, even if they clash with your ideas. She was a great communicator in a very quiet way. 
Lessons from my mom and dad. The number of single parent families I see today concerns me. Having both a mom and a dad as teachers was important in my development. My dad would often say, True intelligence is knowing what is appropriate rather than what is simply right or wrong. As a six year old boy, I learned from my mom that I needed to be kind and gentle. But when I found myself constantly confronted by bullies at school, I also learned that I could at times be too kind and gentle. I hated being called fatty and dumbo. Consequently, after talking with my dad, I learned to be strong and to stand up for myself. But there had to be balance. My father told me that many people live in a black and white world or a right and wrong world. Many say, don't push back, and some say, push back. The key to being successful in life is, if you must push back, you need to know exactly how hard to push. When I got pushed or put down, I learned exactly how hard to push back. Knowing exactly how hard to push requires much more intelligence than simply saying, don't push back, or push back. My dad would often say, true intelligence is knowing what is appropriate rather than what is right or wrong. I think today we need to be more intelligent with our strengths and our weaknesses. It used to be when I was a kid and I got angry with another guy at school. We would begin to wrestle, get tired, and then the fight would be over. The worst that happened was an occasional torn shirt or bloody nose. Today, kids get angry, start thinking in the less intelligent right and wrong mode, break out their guns and shoot each other. We may be in the information age and kids may be more worldly than their parents, but we can all learn to be more intelligent with our information and our emotions. We need to learn from both our mothers and fathers. Because of so much more information, we need to be that much more intelligent. Rich Dad's Rich Kids Smart Kid is also available in paperback from Warner Business Books.